Okay, we're going to get started. We have a very um, packed agenda for this session. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and happy World Oceans Day, and welcome to our session, Strengthening Protections for National Marine Sanctuaries, a key element of fulfilling the national commitment to 30 by 30 and America the Beautiful. My name is Priscilla Brooks, and I am Vice President and Director of Ocean Conservation at Conservation Law Foundation, and I will be moderating today's session. The America the Beautiful initiative has launched at a time when America's oceans and ocean waters around the world are at unprecedented risk to climate change and unsustainable use of its resources. Recent reports by the United Nations Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and the International Panel on Climate Change document in detail the alarming numbers of marine species threatened with extinction and the significant impacts of climate change on the world's ocean waters, which are getting warmer, more acidic, starved of oxygen, and less habitable for fish and other marine wildlife. In response to the global climate and biodiversity crises, and in an effort to build the oceans resilient to climate change, it's critical that the nation in its pursuit of President Biden's bold vision for America the Beautiful and his commitment to protecting 30% of our ocean waters by 2030, not only establish new marine protected areas, but also effectively manage our existing marine protected areas, including national marine sanctuaries. This includes developing and implementing sanctuary management plans that produce meaningful conservation outcomes on the water and result in thriving sanctuary resources and truly sustainable human uses. This afternoon, marine scientists and policy experts will take a broad look at the level of protection provided by our nation's marine protected areas and many of our national marine sanctuaries and what can be done to strengthen their management. We'll take a deep dive into two sanctuaries, Stellwagen Bank and Florida Keys, both of which are undergoing revisions to their management plans. Following the series of presentations, we'll have time for questions. You've all been placed on mute for the duration of the session, so please put your questions in the chat anytime during the session, and I will pose them to the panel after everybody has spoken. Now, for our first presentation, I want to introduce you to Dr. Jenna Sullivan Stack, Research Associate at Oregon State University. Over to you, Jenna. Great, thanks so much. I'm going to share my screen quickly. Okay. Um, as Priscilla said, I'm Jenna Sullivan Stack. Um, I'm a research associate at Oregon State University. And thank you so much to the organizers of the panel for including me and to all of you for joining. Um, this session, as you know, is about how to strengthen protections for the US's national marine sanctuaries. But before we get into specifics about individual sanctuaries from some of the other panelists, I'd like to zoom us out to think about the US's MPA system as a whole, where we are now, um, and where we can make improvements so that our US MPAs deliver the benefits we need for biodiversity conservation, which is the definition of an MPA, its primary goal, but also for climate resilience and equitable access to nature, which are the three main goals of the America the Beautiful initiative. So as you know, as part of that initiative, the US has a target to conserve at least 30% of our ocean by 2030. Um, and a key tool for achieving this target will be MPAs. But not all MPAs are the same. They're designed, resourced, managed differently. They have different local contexts and they allow different activities to happen in their waters, which can have different impacts on the biodiversity that lives there um, and the benefits that it provides. So I'm part of a large group of co-authors. There's 31 of us in total from across the US um, that recently did some research looking at the distribution and types of MP MPA protections we have now so that we can determine how to get to a 30% target in a way that not only achieves that number, but also brings us the benefits that we need. We used a framework called the MPA guide. So this slide summarizes the main elements that make up the guide. Um, I don't have time here to explain them all in detail, but please reach out or visit the website that I'll have at the end um, to learn more. So the first element in the guide is the stage of establishment. This is the degree to which an MPA is operational in the water. Um, an MPA can go, has to go beyond just being announced or designated in law to being actively actually implemented in the water 
to have biodiversity conservation take place. And ideally it's actively managed with community engagement, ongoing monitoring and management evaluation happening. The second is the level of protection. And this describes the impact of extractive and destructive activities happening in the MPA and their impact to biodiversity, regardless of which jurisdictional authority is regulating those activities. So the levels range from fully protected where no extractive or destructive activities are taking place to highly protected, which has very low impacts for example, from traditional sustainable fishing to lightly and minimally protected, which allow larger impacts from things like large scale commercial fishing, infrastructure or aquaculture. The third element is the enabling conditions. And these are incredibly important prerequisites for an MPA to be effective and equitable. They include things like adequate resources, recognition and support and co-management with existing rights holders like indigenous people, long-term political will, collaboration with local communities, transparency. We've been hearing a lot at this conference about the importance of these social considerations in addition to the ecological considerations. And the last is outcomes. If the enabling conditions are in place and the MPA is at least implemented in the water, then the outcomes that can be expected tie directly to the level of protection. We know from decades of research that fully and highly protected MPAs are those that can provide the best benefits to biodiversity and they also can provide broad benefits for other things as well, like spillover for fisheries outside of MPA boundaries, climate resilience, providing sentinel sites for scientific research, protecting cultural resources and other social benefits. So in our research, we took advantage of this new framework, the MPA guide to assess MPAs in the US according to the level of protection and stage of establishment and to get an idea of what benefits we might expect out of our US MPA area. This allows us to take stock of what we have now and help determine what more we need. We looked at the 50 MPAs, um, and that makes up 99.7% of all US MPA area. So here are our results. We found 26% of US waters are in an MPA, um, and the vast majority of this area is fully or highly protected. And most US MPAs are at the actively managed stage of establishment, which is great and a testament to all of the um, resources and investment in these areas. But when we zoom in on that protection, we find that only 1.9% of waters around the continental US are protected in any kind of MPA. And most of that area is lightly or minimally protected. So this discrepancy between the 26% and the 1.9% numbers reflects that almost all of our MPA protection is in large MPAs out in the central Pacific. Level of protection varies a lot by regions, but no regions beside the central Pacific are close to an MPA 30% um, target. So this graphic shows the proportion of MPA protections across different regions um, with total MPA area in the dark blue and or total marine area in the dark blue and total MPA area in the lighter blue. Um, and you see that all of the regions besides the Pacific have very low coverage in MPAs of any kind. And if we look at the level of protection that those MPAs are offering, um, we see again that the regions outside the cent central Pacific are mostly those green and yellow colors indicating lightly and minimally protected areas. So our national marine sanctuaries are some of the biggest MPAs we have in this country, especially outside of the Central Pacific. And a lot of the area that we assess in this analysis is encompassed in these nine national marine sanctuaries um, that we assessed. So there's been a lot of investment in these, these MPAs, a lot of exciting research happening in their waters, which helps provide those benefits um, of MPAs as sentinel sites, especially in the face of climate change. Um, all of these national marine sanctuaries we assess are actively managed and include collaborations and partnerships, ongoing monitoring. There are some great examples here, um, especially of the enabling conditions in action, but there are big impacts happening in these MPAs and there's large scale commercial fishing um, that takes out a lot of biomass and uses gears that are destructive to ecosystems, um, destructive anchoring, which, and it puts almost all of these national marine sanctuaries in minimally protected. Um, and these, I, these high impacts can really curtail the benefits that the areas can provide. So one of the things I heard loud and clear from yesterday's virtual breakout session on um, National Marine Sanctuaries was that we need to invest more resources and build more support for their functioning to ensure that they better protect the invaluable ecosystems um, in their waters. That support would help bring about the long-term political will that's needed to lower the impacts that are currently happening and better protect biodiversity. Um, and the areas are incredibly important. They're invariably some of our largest MPA areas in the places that are close to where people live in the US. So they give us real opportunities to bring MPAs and their benefits to people where they live. 
So thanks so much for inviting me uh, to participate today. I'm gonna pass it back to Priscilla and I look forward to our discussion. Great, thanks so much, uh, Jenna. And just as a reminder, everyone, um, if you would like to ask questions, we'll take them at the end of all the presentations. So feel free to put them in the chat at any time. Okay, I am gonna talk about Cell Wagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Um, put this in. Right. Cell Wagon Bank is one of the most remarkable places in New England's ocean and is truly deserving of its National Marine Sanctuary status located in the Gulf of Maine and spanning 842 square miles. The sanctuary comprises a dynamic system of shallow banks, boulder reefs, and sand plains that interact with the wind, tides, and currents, resulting in extraordinary productivity and biodiversity. The sanctuary supports over 575 species of fish, seabirds, marine mammals, and invertebrates. Um, it is also home to over 200 shipwrecks, some more than a century old. Delwagon is located only 30 miles from Boston and in many ways is an urban sanctuary with the Boston shipping lanes running through the middle of it. I had the great opportunity to serve on Stellwagen's Sanctuary Advisory Council at a time when it was undergoing its first management plan revision more than 10 years ago. And now the sanctuary has embarked on a second revision to its management plan. As a prelude to developing the plan, in 2020, the sanctuary issued a condition report using the best available science and data to assess the status and trends of the sanctuary's ecosystem. The report documents widespread depletion of the sanctuary's living marine resources, degradation of its benthic and acoustic habitat, and maritime heritage resources, and a compromised ability of the sanctuary to provide food for people. Despite Stellwagen's designation in 1992, Stellwagen has become a sanctuary in name only. Its remarkable resources have been and continue to be subject to relentless human activities that are depleting and degrading Stellwagen's once extraordinary ecosystem. According to the condition report, some of New England's most iconic species, including the North Atlantic right whale, humpback whale, and Atlantic cod are poor or fair to poor condition. And in some cases, the condition is worsening. There have been measurable degradation of habitat quality over the past decade, due primarily to the impacts of commercial fishing gear Increasing levels of ocean noise that interrupt behavior and communication for many species is also contributing to the degradation of habitat quality at Stellwagen. And the sanctuary's maritime heritage resources, including some 200 shipwrecks, are subject to severe, persistent, and widespread impacts from contact with fishing gear, which has affected nearly every maritime heritage resource in the sanctuary. Despite these conditions, the sanctuary issued a draft management plan late last year without any concrete actions or new regulations to address these issues, aside from continued, continued research and monitoring. The sanctuary can and must do better than this. It has a great opportunity and responsibility to better balance protection of resources and human uses by developing a final management plan that implements effective actions to protect its extraordinary resources and allow the sanctuary to thrive for generations. To provide a more intimate from the field perspective on Stellwagen, I'll now pass the floor to my colleague, Dr. Les Kaufman, who's been conducting research in Stellwagen for three decades. Over to you, Les. Sorry, I had to unmute. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Priscilla. Um, whoops. Can you guys hear me? 
Are you? Yes, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> I wasn't hearing you. All right. Um, I'm a fish ecologist. I, I work a lot in the tropics, but for most of my adult life, I've been teaching and doing research on Stellwagen Bank and Cape Cod. I've lived, eaten, and breathed the life of Stellwagen Bank, getting close to the action on commercial fishing boats, whale watching vessels, research ships as a recreational fisherman, and on pleasure craft. The problems I've been most focused on involve our fisheries and the wild fishes they rely on, particularly some of the species that Priscilla mentioned. Then there are the so-called forage species, sand lances, herrings, and squids. These serve as the link between the rich fields of plankton that the bank yields as interest and the fishes that wind up as fillets on your plate. I've also served on the Science and Stats Committee for the New England Fishery Management Council, where we vet the science that is used to set the fishing quotas. So I know Stoag and Bank from many angles, including as an angler, and I've watched it change over these 40 some years. Well, these years have not been kind to Stoag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary. I've witnessed a rapid decline in the ecological health of this patch of ocean, a loss of health that was well reflected in the sanctuary's condition report. That's not bad enough. It's a decline that we've been forced to stand by impotently and watch go by. Something has got to be done. Some of the decline in the sanctuary's health is the result of climate change. And while it's not within the National Marine Sanctuary Program's mandate to stop this from happening, it can work to compensate and adapt. Warming waters, ebbing productivity, and shifting animal distributions can make the things we can help directly that much more important to do. The sanctuary is typical of the national marine sanctuary system in that it is suffering profoundly from inadequate stewardship. Stoagen faces a combined challenge from insufficient resources, a lack of management authority, its location in a body of water strongly influenced by global climate change and a very intensive human use by oft conflicting parties and purposes. A decline in the condition of the sanctuary is not due to any lack of effort by the sanctuary's dedicated staff, but they are fighting a losing battle. A nation was built on the backs of Stoag and Cod, a wild animal whose stocks are at 5% or less of healthy levels and are now uniquely concentrated in and near this sanctuary, where serious protection could pay huge dividends and benefit the entire region. However, Stoagen's cod are being managed as an extractable commodity under fisheries jurisdiction, and not at all as the large, important wildlife that they also are. Some people see buffalo, others see flank steak. The management needs for wildlife and extractive resources are different, putting fisheries at odds with other uses. Fishery managers want to see fish populations that are producing as much extractable flesh as possible and along with it, livelihoods and value chains. For this purpose, fishes should only be left in the water until they spawned a few times, but are still young and putting weight on quickly. Wildlife conservationists want to see fish that grow big, old, and maximally fecund. These visions are at odds, but fishes are managed under fisheries for extraction exclusively. There's no balance between this and management for the large old fish that play big trolls in the sanctuary's ecology, and that shoulder the lion's share in sustaining the population of the whole Gulf of Maine for the longer game. Fishing is an important part of our New England heritage, but it isn't without its unintended consequences. Stellwagen is a critical feeding area for the world's most endangered great whale, the North Atlantic right whale. But this species is now teetering on the precipice of extinction. It and all whales, sea turtles, and many seabirds are dying and suffering through entanglements in fishing gear, both within, within and near the sanctuary. Habitat quality is being degraded on the sea bottom by dragged and lost fishing gear and in the water column by rising noise levels. So getting back to the point, the sanctuary is sliding downhill, something must be done to stop it, and we know what to do. Uh, Priscilla, next slide, please. Priscilla, are you there? Yeah, thanks. First off, we can slow down and limit, or at least reduce, ship strikes. We can monitor and manage the noise levels to prevent harm to wildlife, not just marine mammals, but fishes too. 
we can, this is controversial, but we can prohibit fishing for Atlantic cod inside the sanctuary because it's one of the last places where they feed, grow, and reproduce in abundance. And they're the key to a future for this all important fish throughout the region. We can manage fish as wildlife, not just as commodities. We can insist that any fishing gear that harms wildlife has no place in a national marine sanctuary. We can designate wildlife replenishment zones within the sanctuary off limits to fishing, but these also serve as critical scientific reference areas that are needed by sanctuary managers to know what to do next. And we can protect the foundational species like sand lances and herons to the benefit of all other sanctuary wildlife as well as people. The need for these measures was clearly identified in the most recent condition report. There's only one thing missing, action. Without action, use of the term sanctuary is absurd. Changing this requires a rigorous, open-minded, ecosystem-based approach, meaning the sanctuary must have more jurisdictional authority. Management should result in stewardship for the long term to the benefit of all users forever, and not just immediate profits today even while retaining a respect for fishing as an important way of life in the region. Management should make for healthy wildlife, not just resource extraction. We've been loath to take real action before this. Now is the time if we want our national marine sanctuary system to be effective. Thanks, and I now hand the stage over to my colleague, Senior Scientist, Oceans Division, NRDC, Francine. Sure. <laughs> Just share my screen here. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Lev. It, it's a real pleasure to be able to participate in Chow and present you all today on the topic of quieting our sanctuaries. So our marine sanctuaries are an acoustic world. As you descend from the surface, visibility quickly fades, meaning that marine life has evolved to rely on sounds rather than sight. Underwater sounds provide windows for marine species into the world around them. For example, sounds can help marine species locate safe habitats and communities, can help them detect predators, help them detect food, and sounds also help individuals communicate with each other. But since the industrial age, humans have been injecting more and more noise pollution into our ocean. And noise has adverse effects on marine life, ranging from the acute to chronic, depending on the type of noise. They may avoid important habitats and need to change their vocalizations to be heard above the din. They, be, they may view noise as a predator, leading to alarm responses, changes in swim speed and direction, um, and, and experience elevated respiration rates and stress. And at close distances, animals experience temporary or permanent hearing loss or may be otherwise injured. And in some cases, those injuries may lead to death. Almost every marine species studied from seagrass to zooplankton to lobster to fish to the largest whales are affected by noise in similar ways, meaning that it's truly a marine ecosystem health issue. Fortunately, from fall 2018 through spring 2022, NOAA and the US Navy have been working to better understand underwater sound within the National Marine Sanctuary System. For the last four years, they've worked with partners to study sound within seven national marine sanctuaries and one marine national monument, which include waters off Hawaii and the east and west coasts of the US mainland. This information will be invaluable in informing marine um, management strategies to help make our sanctuaries quieter. And each of the areas studies are all very interesting and all very different from a noise perspective. But for this talk, I'm going to focus in on Stellwag and Bank. So as part of the Sanctuary project, three acoustic recording sites and a mobile acoustic glider were deployed in the sanctuary. And one notable feature of Stellwagen is that um, it has an international shipping lane servicing Boston Harbor traversing the sanctuary. And that's shown by the two yellow lines in the lower right figure. And indeed those big commercial ships leave a big acoustic footprint on the sanctuary. And in fact, Stellwagen has the most continuous loud noise of any sanctuary study. As you can see from the middle and right hand graphs here, vessel noise is present during 89% of hours in each month, and 71% of that noise originated from large commercial ships. That said, small and medium sized vessels, like those used by the whale watching and fishing industries, also contribute towards noise in the sanctuary. And those vessels produce noise at different frequencies compared to commercial ships, 
and so may have different impacts on marine life. Thus, each of these vessel types offers an opportunity for management and noise reduction within the sanctuary. And managing noise within the sanctuary is important, as, as Les men just mentioned, as noise is having measurable effects on some of Stellwagen Bank's most iconic and in some cases most endangered marine life. Atlantic cod are struggling to recover from overfishing and use habitat within Stellwagen Bank during their winter spawning period. During this period, they make sounds known as grunts that are important for successful reproduction. A scientific study published in 2016 estimated the distance over which the grunts might be heard during the noisiest periods where there was most vessel traffic and found that distance to only be on the order of 1.3 meters, so very close to the vocalizing animal. If a grunt goes undetected or is misinterpreted, it could lead to mistiming or unsuccessful location of a spawning event. Similarly, scientific studies have indicated that different types of large whale vocalizations experience masking levels of 80% or more within the sanctuary, resulting in between a 16 to up to a 2,100 kilometer square reduction in communication area, depending on the species and the cull type. Now, humpback whales are an iconic species that also drive a profitable whale watching industry and drowning out humpback whale song and social sounds may impair breeding and feeding success. Fortunately, there are a number of different ways for vessels to reduce noise, including um, using different noise reduction technologies. But one of the simplest ways is for vessels to slow down. The noise produced by vessels originates largely from the collapse of bubbles produced by the propeller, a process called bubble cavitation. Slowing down the propeller reduces levels of bubble bubble cavitation and thus reduces noise. It's not a linear relationship, nor is it a silver bullet, but it is, it's a good starting point. And slowing vessels down to 10 knots or less also has the co-benefit of significantly reducing the incidence and severity of vessel strikes to large whales, and in some circumstances, sea turtles. So slowing all vessels down within the sanctuary would help protect these and other vulnerable species. So in some, Stellwagen Bank can be a quieter sanctuary for marine life, but this will require proactive management of noise within the sanctuary. A helpful first step would be to conduct sector-specific noise management planning in partnership with stakeholders from the fishing and whale watching industries. And this would provide a means to explore available options and noise reduction priorities, while also considering the specific needs of the industry and the broader context of the sanctuary soundscape. Noise mitigation measures should then be implemented within 12 months of the planning process to ensure the sanctuary is making meaningful improvements. And the commercial shipping lane cannot be ignored. Um, sanctuary staff could work with NOAA to advance noise reduction strategies at the International Maritime Organization level or explore incentives with Boston Harbor. And in the interim, building on existing vessel slowdown measures instituted by the sanctuary and, and slowing all vessels down to 10 knots or less within the boundaries will provide large whales and sea turtles with further relief from vessel strike um, risk, while also providing an immediate noise reduction benefit. And so with that, thank you so much for your attention. I'm now delighted to pass the baton to Sarah Barmeyer, uh, Senior Managing Director of the National Parks Conservation Association. Great, thank you so much, Francine. And I will pull my presentation up. So thank you all for joining today. Um, so the National Parks Conservation Association works to protect and preserve our, nation, our nation's most iconic and inspirational places for future generations. Through the America the Beautiful initiative, the Biden administration has embraced the conservation goal of protecting 30% of our lands and waters by 2030 to defend against the worst effects of warming temperatures and threats to biodiversity. Conserving America's most valuable underwater treasures, whether it's through national parks, national marine sanctuaries, or our marine national monuments, and strengthening marine protections in these places, is an important step the federal government can take right now to meet the goal of 30 by 30. 
So bordering three of America's national parks, Everglades, Biscayne and Dry Tortugas, and surrounding several national wildlife refuges, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is a national treasure in its own right. Established in 1990, the sanctuary protects over 6,000 marine species, approximately 800 underwater cultural and historical sites, diverse habitats, and is part of the third largest barrier reef ecosystem in the world. Protection of the sanctuary promotes ecosystem health along the entire Florida Reef tract. The sanctuary is also an important economic driver in the Florida Keys, supporting around 43,000 jobs in a, in a county containing only 75,000 residents and contributing an estimated $4.4 billion to Florida's economy. Unfortunately, the sanctuary's natural resources and the people who depend on them are facing a range of threats, including impacts from increased use resulting in boat groundings and anchor damage, overfishing, marine debris, pollution, intensifying storms, disease outbreaks, rising open ocean temperatures, and ocean acidification, many of which are only going to be intensified uh, given climate change. So this historical series um, of photographs, this documents the loss of large trophy fish from the Florida Keys from 1956 to 2007, using both visual and quantitative evidence. So landings in the 1950s were dominated by large groupers and other large predatory fish, including sharks. Over time, the mean fish size declined from an estimated 44 pounds to only five pounds, and there was a major shift in species composition. In contrast, landings in 2007 were composed of small snappers with an average length of 13 and a half inches, and the average length of sharks declined by more than 50% over the years. Our coral reefs aren't faring so well either. Uh, this is a time series of coral, the coral reef of Grecian rocks at Key Largo, illustrating an example of dramatic decline in live coral in Florida Keys reefs. Um, the Florida Reef Tract has been ravaged by a confluence of factors in recent years from severe bleaching to stony coral tissue loss disease and just damage from overuse. Sanctuary managers have reported they estimate um, approximately only 2% of live coral exists in the sanctuary today. So in response to these impacts, as well as taking a comprehensive look at ways to protect the ecosystem, Florida Key Sanctuary Managers released a draft environmental impact statement in 2019, which is referred to as the Restoration Blueprint, and it's expected to be finalized this summer. So there are policy proposals included in the Restoration Blueprint that align directly with the America the Beautiful initiative and will counteract the decline of habitat, wildlife, and cultural resources. So the slide shows our recommendations. So first, NOAA should expand sanctuary boundaries to include Pulley Ridge, which is just west of Dry Tortugas National Park. By doing this, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary would protect a cooler, deeper refuge for healthy corals that could help rebuild nearby populations of shallower corals of the same species in the sanctuary and at Dry Tortugas National Park. The second is to protect um, the most sensitive habitats with shoreline to reef zones such as at Boca Chica and Carries Fort Reef, and also expand the number and size of marine protected areas in the Tortugas Corridor. And finally, prevent increasing damage to seagrass meadows and protect wildlife by slowing boats in appropriate shallow water throughout the sanctuary. Limiting speeds is a very important uh, step to restoring seagrass meadows, which provide critical habitat for federally endangered manatees, sea turtles, and economically important game fish like tarpon. So the Pulley Ridge and, Dry and Tortugas Corridor are sensitive habitats that are physically connected to the Florida Keys via the loop current, which you can see from this map. And they're ecologically connected to the Florida Keys for fish and coral species and provide an upstream source of larva. So expanding the sanctuary boundaries and strengthening marine protections in these areas would allow these areas to recover levels of biodiversity and abundance that would then spill across their boundaries and over time, will actually increase fish size and diversity and abundance and benefit other resources throughout the sanctuary elsewhere. So in summary, Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary Blueprint really provides immediate opportunity right now to implement meaningful and lasting protections for the only living coral reef in the continental US and will help achieve the goals of the Biden administration's America the Beautiful initiative. So thank you and I will turn this over to Sarah Chasis, who is the Senior Strategist uh, for the Oceans Division at NRDC.
Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thanks everyone for joining this session. This is really an important issue. As we've heard, our nation lacks effectively protected marine areas in most regions of our country. Strengthening marine sanctuaries, including those in key regions like the Gulf of Maine and Florida Keys can really help meet this challenge. I have four recommendations I'd like to make for strengthening our marine sanctuaries. First, sanctuary management plans and regulations must effectively protect sanctuary resources and respond to threats identified in sanctuary condition reports. We just heard that despite overwhelming scientific evidence of worsening conditions documented in NOAA's own condition report, the Stellwagen Bank uh, draft management plan proposes no management actions and no additions or modifications of sanctuary regulations. Yet the Sanctuaries Act requires NOAA to revise sanctuary management plans and regulations as necessary to fulfill the purposes and policies of the Act. A central purpose of the Act is to maintain the natural biological communities and to protect habitat, natural habitats, populations, and ecological processes in the sanctuaries. Where a sanctuary condition report documents worsening conditions, the management plan and regulations must respond with actions that will protect sanctuary resources. Second, sanctuary designation documents should authorize regulation of a broad range of uses that may adversely affect sanctuary resources. As part of the process of creating a sanctuary, NOAA is required to prepare a designation document. By statute in the designation document, NOAA must identify the types of activities that will be subject to regulation by the sanctuary. If an activity is not identified in the designation document, it may not be regulated by the sanctuary. Making sure that the designation document authorizes the sanctuary to regulate a broad range of activities that may potentially impact the sanctuary now and in the future is thus very important. If the designation document does not authorize sanctuary regulation of a particular activity that is damaging sanctuary resources, and if the federal agency that typically manages that type of activity does not work with the sanctuary to, for, to effectively do so, then the designation document should be modified to enable the sanctuary to regulate that activity. Third, NOAA must utilize its authority over regulated uses in order to better protect sanctuary resources. If an activity is identified in this designation document as subject to regulation, then NOAA should regulate that activity to protect sanctuary resources. For example, if the designation document identifies vessel operations as an activity subject to regulation, uh, and vessel operations are contributing to ship strikes and noise impacts that are harming marine mammals and other wildlife, NOAA must regulate those operations so as to protect those resources. Fourth, sanctuary management plans and regulations must be reviewed and updated to address changing conditions and current challenges on a more regular basis. Every five years, the secretary is required to evaluate the substantive progress towards implementing the sanctuary's management plan and is required to revise the plan and regulations as needed to fill, fulfill the purposes and policies of the act. The current Stellwagen management plan was adopted in 2020, I mean, sorry, 20, 2010, and the sanctuary regulations were adopted in 1993, nearly 30 years ago. The management plan for the Florida Keys dates back to 2011. Management plans and regulations need to be updated more regularly in order to effectively protect sanctuary resources. Adoption of these four recommendations would contribute to making the National Marine Sanctuary System more effective in conserving important areas of America's oceans and furthering 30 by 30 and America the Beautiful. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it back to Priscilla Brooks. Uh, great, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and to all the speakers. Um, and thanks to um, the many people ha who have joined this session. Um, it's fantastic. We have about uh, you know four minutes for questions. So um, if you have questions, add them to the chat. Um, some of our 
um, panelists have been answering them along the way. Um, I have a question. Um, what you know for Sarah Chasis, and that is, um, is there an example, Sarah, of a sanctuary where the designation document has been amended? to authorize the sanctuary to regulate fishing or another activity that the sanctuary has then gone forward, been able to then go forward to regulate that activity? Yes, a good example of that is Gray's Reef in the South Atlantic. That's a national marine sanctuary. And uh, there was interest in creating a research reserve in the sanctuary, uh, but the designation document for the sanctuary did not authorize the sanctuary to regulate fishing. Uh, the sanctuary went through a process. Uh, they actually asked the South Atlantic Council to develop regulations. The council opted not to, but then the sanctuary went ahead and both amended its designation document to authorize it to regulate fishing and use that authority to adopt regulations that, pro that created a research reserve within the sanctuary where all fishing is prohibited. So that I think is an important example. It's always better, of course, to have the authority to regulate important activities contained in the original designation document, but it is possible to amend the designation document to expand the authority when necessary. Great, uh, thanks, Sarah. Does it, do any of the panelists wanna add on to that at all? Um, yeah, I just like to, I mean, yes. whoops, one minute, there I am again. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody complains about not having enough money or staff, but I mean, this is serious. I mean, the, the sanctuary program is substantially under-resourced, not just Stelwag and everybody. Um, we had a little lesson in this in Florida when uh, we started Mission Iconic Reefs to help restore the coral reef there. Meanwhile, one of our colleagues, uh, in fact, the leader of the effort, began work in Saudi Arabia, where they have access to enormous resources to do much less. And yeah, it's Saudi Arabia, but we can do better. I, I think another point that uh, one, of the, one of our audience indicated is that there isn't much of a lobby for things other than whales and birds as wildlife. But if, I don't know, to me, the fish are just as inspirational. Maybe we need to spread that message a little bit. Thanks, Les. Um, I have a, there's a question in the chat from Sandy Aylesworth um, or Sarah um, asking, um, use Sarah, uh, Sarah to say more about um, your recommendation number three. What's an example where NOAA could use its authority more fully to better protect a national marine sanctuary? Thanks for that question, Sandy. Um, well, actually, Stellwagen is an example because in the designation document, um, they have regulatory authority over vessel operations. And as we've heard from uh, both Les and Francine and Priscilla, there are you know, real risks to marine mammals and other wildlife from vessel operations in the sanctuary. And yet, um, you know, the sanctuary has not been utilizing that authority to date in an effective way. And so that's, I think, a good example of where there is existing authority and, and they need to take action. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, this brings our session to a close. I know there's another session starting up now. So I want to thank all the panelists, thank the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and thank all of you for, for joining this session. I'm sure that any one of us would be happy to uh, follow up with you um, at another time. And I'm pretty sure our contact information is available um, through Chow. So thanks so much. Bye-bye, everybody.